How much do we need one another? I was cycling recently when a car passed me and cut in front of me with one of those dog bumper stickers on the back of it. It was along the lines of, you know, the more I meet people, the more I like my dog. But the average dog is a nicer person than the average person. Dogs are God's way of apologizing for your relatives. And the simple but clear message, dogs over people, dogs greater than people. I do like dogs. I mean, I struggle with cats. But I think there's one thing that we all learn from COVID. We are made to be in relationship with other people. Statistically, we know isolation had a big impact during COVID lockdowns, and most of it was not for our good. We are made to be in relationship with other human beings. And from a Christian perspective, that all makes sense. The, the God of the Bible is a God who has forever existed in a community. We call it the Trinity, and it is a mystery, though clearly revealed in Scripture. God exists as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Spirit. The Spirit is not the Father. Each are distinct, but perfectly one. A compound unity in perfect relationship. We got a glimpse of that last week as we looked at the prayer of Jesus to his Father when Jesus prayed that we would be one as Jesus is one with the Father. That's a high goal, but one that Jesus prayed for nonetheless. And from Scripture's perspective, all human beings are created in God's image and made to relate to one another. And for those who are in Christ, their faith makes an extraordinary unity possible because the foundation is God who has also given us help through the Holy Spirit, who gifts us with the oneness we are then to contend for. And yet, relationships with people can be hard, including relationships among Christians. Sometimes the oneness of the perfect trinity is so far removed from our experience. Dogs are easy, but people? From business to church and even family, it's hard. And for some, even Father's Day is hard. What we hope for, what we long for, is such a disappointment. We want and need to be in relationship, but it can be so very difficult. And th this might surprise you. The Bible is realistic about this. Today we are going to look at a case in point that illustrates relationship under stress and what we can do to be proactive from our side of the relationship. In 2 Corinthians, we have arguably the most relational or personal letter from the Apostle Paul in the New Testament. And there is plenty of relational angst. In a previous letter, 1 Corinthians, Paul had to correct the church. I do not write these things to make you ashamed, but to admonish you as my beloved children. For though you have countless guides in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Paul writes as a father to his children, and he continues that tone in the passage of 2 Corinthians we are going to look at today. We have spoken freely to you, Corinthians. Our heart is wide open. You are not restricted by us, but you are restricted in your own affections. In return, I speak as to children. Widen your hearts also. So jumping in the middle of this conversation, it is not difficult to see that there is a relational tension that we are listening in on. And although it is a relationship conversation between church leader and the church, the principles for relationship from this can be applied for believer to believer. It can be applied in our families, and on this day, importantly, to fathers and their relationship to their kids, all of our relationships, to make them better. This is important. Last week, we saw that we are designed for relationship, and being in community will be strategic in helping us to grow in God individually and together while affecting our witness to the world. And today, we dive a little deeper into an important ingredient to that, open hearts. There's a word we use today that is a close cousin to this, authenticity. Some of the synonyms to authenticity are genuine, real, true, legit, actual. You get the picture. I have come to see how important this is to our spiritual growth. If we are going to be in healthy relationships, if church is going to be healthy, we cannot be fake. And this is, of course, is where the challenge is, because being authentic, being open, makes us vulnerable. A while back, a friend of mine was relating to me a sad story within his close circle. He was part of a small men's group in which they were purposely accountable to one another, or so it seemed. Then one day he received a phone call that left him reeling. 
One of his close friends within the group had taken his life. There was a dark side to his friend's story that my friend had, had been hidden from him and, and from the rest. And instead of disclosing and getting help, he had chosen to conceal it and battle it alone, only to find it overwhelming to the point of complete despair. All was not what it seemed. In this case, the hiddenness was lethal. I've been in church circles long enough to know that there can be this pressure to have it all together. We feel that we will only be acceptable to others if we measure up to a, a certain standard. And sometimes people feel that way falsely, but sometimes they feel that way because it is true. Whether spoken or unspoken, community acceptance is handed out only when people live by the code, whatever that is. And it is the opposite of a community shaped around the gospel of Christ in which we are accepted because of what God has done in Christ, not by something we ourselves must do. Paul writes, we have spoken freely to you. Our hearts are wide open. To speak freely means to speak with frankness. Paul had been truthful. The Corinthians really did need correction in their thinking and how they were living and doing community, but the truth Paul spoke with his, and the team spoke was accompanied by open affection. Their hearts were wide open. Truth and love. This is the Christian way. Now you can go for superficiality and false peace, but Paul chose authentic community. In the best of relationships, there is a developing openness so that we can actually know one another and help each other with our strengths and our weaknesses. And to encourage and correct, Paul has been that way and will be that way, open to the Corinthians, but they have not been that way to him. You are not restricted by us, he says, but you are restricted in your own affections. In return, widen your hearts also. The word restrictive conveys the idea of a, a narrowing space, a, a squeezing out of relationship. Paul's plea to open or widen their hearts. This is something he will repeat later. It, it should hit us with emphasis as we think about how we can make Christian community a regular, important part of our walk to follow Jesus well in our 168, every hour of the week. Paul knows real growth only happens in real relationships. And don't you want to live in real relationships? We're not just going after checking a box that we have attended a church service with other people or are part of a community group, check. We want to be doing community in a way in which we are developing authentic, open-hearted relationships that move us towards Jesus. Paul couldn't control how others would respond to him, but he shows us how we can be responsible for what we do in making our relationships real. And I put them into five insights to help us get there. First, open, widen your heart first. As Paul did, make the first move, bring your whole self to your relationships. Christian pastor and author Peter Scazzaro says, in some Christian circles, repressing or disavowing authentic emotion is considered a virtue or perhaps even a gift of spirit. Denying anger, ignoring pain, skipping over depression, running from loneliness and avoiding doubt are not only considered normal, but actually virtuous ways of living out one's spiritual life. But this is not the model we find in Jesus. This superficial and incomplete understanding of Scripture severely stunts our spiritual growth and our ability to love well. It also erodes any possibility of developing authentic Christian community. We build walls of separation and cannot truly see one another. We fear vulnerability and lie about what is that is going on inside of us. So instead of inviting people to become more fully alive, we unintentionally create a religious subculture that constricts and deprives people from experiencing the full range of their God-given humanity. The word affections Paul speaks about in 2 Corinthians, it was literally a reference to the inward parts of a person, their heart, their lungs, their kidneys, liver. The, the King James Version translates it bowels. It metaphorically means a deep-seated expression of a person, especially in their emotions. The word we use for this is heart. To be open-hearted with others, I believe, begins with an open heart with God. If we can't be real with God, it will be so hard to be real with others. When we know that we can be who we are with no pretending and find that although God loves us not to let us stay where we are, God loves us as we are. 
we are then in a position to love others with our whole hearts. Do you know that God loves you today? Look at the cross. Look at what God gave us in his son, Jesus. See the forgiveness that flows from his body broken for you, his blood shed for you. And tell your soul, I am loved, accepted in Jesus. Widen, open your heart to God. The Psalms are super helpful here. Look at their honesty. You don't have to pretend with God. Then make the first move with others and open your heart to them. Motivated by love, conversations sound like this. And here's what I struggle with. Or, can you pray for me? I'd like to grow in this area. Or, can you help me to see my blind spots? Or, can, can I tell you what you did, how, how that made me feel? Or, I love it when you do this. Or, I think what you're doing is wrong. Can I tell you why? There's a risk to this. In open, real conversations, as we strip away the pretend layers in our lives, we put ourselves in a vulnerable position. Christian clinical psychologist Mark Baker writes, we were created for the purpose of connection to God and others, and vulnerability is the requirement for achieving that purpose. Of course, wisdom is required as to who we open up to and, and to what depth. There is a risk of being hurt. But we should understand that vulnerability is the price of admission for authentic, life-changing community that we are called into. Let's move towards that. I don't think it is a coincidence that the secular speaker and author, Brene Brown, has become incredibly popular over the last few years. Brene has been brave to call out hypocrisy and pretending in our society and business by first sharing her own stories of shame and inadequacy. She has been vulnerable and instead of the world shutting her out, it has embraced her as one whose example has given courage to others to do the same. In Brene's words, you either walk inside your story and own it, or you stand outside your story and hustle for your worthiness. So we can put on these plastic fronts and all the while we are dying inside and no one knows the help that we really need because we're all pretending everything is okay. But especially as Christians, we can know with with all our failures and shortcomings, our worth is not based on measuring up to human standards, but on God's unchanging perspective that you are so valuable, Jesus gave his life for you. Open your heart. Make the first move. Thinking about family on Father's Day, when we model this to our kids in the right way, we are teaching them good practices for emotional well-being, which leads to a closer bond between us and sets them up for better mental health going forward. Two, invite others to open their hearts. We encourage this in others by first who we are, then by the conversations we have with others. Paul has written earlier in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, we put no obstacle in anyone's way so that no fault may be found with our ministry, but as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way. Paul then goes on to remind the Corinthians about what they have gone through as apostles in order to bring them the good news of Jesus. It has not been easy. As servants of God, he says, they can be commended in every way by great endurance and afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger, by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, the Holy Spirit. In all this, their love has shown to be genuine and truthful Though some have dishonored them, even slandered them, Paul can confidently say in chapter 7, Make room in your hearts for us. We have wronged no one. We have corrupted no one. We have taken advantage of no one. I have seen, as you probably have, how certain people, others just open up to them. Why is that? The way that they live and conduct themselves causes others to see them as safe and trustworthy. How many of us have confided in someone only to be burned? If we want to go deeper in our conversation and relationships, that will happen best as we show ourselves to be people you can have confidence in, that you have the best interest of others at heart. And of course, as we want what is best for others, our words will then invite others into more open-hearted relationships too. As Paul said, make room in your hearts. He urges, now, it depends on the relationship as to whether you would be that direct, but one thing is for sure, we can take interest 
We can be intentional and we can ask questions. How are you doing with intention? Looking people in the eyes, how are you really doing? It is amazing what takes place when you are genuinely interested in another person and ask questions that invite a deeper level of understanding. This is true in family and so needed in family. I love watching my kids parent. My one daughter and her husband, they have obviously been teaching their little kids, three and four years old, something along what we're talking about today. On more than one occasion, soon after arriving at their house, one of their little ones will look me in the eyes and ask, how is your day today, Papa? I mean, come on, who does that? And I feel so loved when that happens. There's interest, care, concern. And we know what it is to experience less. Ian Harbour is a communications director for a not-for-profit not organization. And he says this, when, when I was in high school, a friend and I coined the phrase chair dad. A chair dad comes home from work after 5 p.m., sits in his chair with a beer, turns on a sports show, and checks out. We talked about chair dads because we had friends with chair dads. There were lots of chair dads. They never said anything particularly harmful and even made some good memories. But investing in their son's character and future was not the priority. They lived on autopilot. They left their son's formation up to chance. They left their son's discipleship to the youth group or even further removed the Christian school we attended. They assumed that going to work and providing for a home and education was all they had to do to express their love. They sat in their chairs and let their sons grow up without them. Kids want more from their parents. Dads, your kids want to know you. I love some of the conversations I've had with dads in this church who I know take seriously their role to invest in their kids. And part of that being real with them, at the appropriate age, of course, is sharing some of your story with them and asking them to share what's going on in theirs. Let's continue. If we're going to be real, part of that is going to be this. Be open with your weaknesses. The Apostle Paul was being denigrated by some at Corinth in comparison to a group of other leaders some label as super apostles. Read between the lines. Maybe Paul wasn't that eloquent a speaker and his appearance not the most attractive. And something was going on with Paul which he addresses head on in a couple of chapters later. A weakness. All of us have strengths and weaknesses. If others are to know us and help us and we are to help them, we've got to know the best and the difficult in one another. As we grow in relationship and trust, this can lead to a place for honesty and even confession of sin, acknowledgement of struggle. And as it comes out into the open, somehow the power of sin that combines us is itself weakened. And in a community of truth and love, there's healing, deliverance. In the 40 days of developing influence, on one of the days we talked about how brokenness is in everyone's story. Broken dreams, anxiety, unemployment, addiction, shame, loss, fractured relationships, abuse, rejection, tragedy. But because brokenness is in everyone's story, it can become a bridge to something greater. Instead of the pain-free illusion of the Christian life accompanied by a judgmental spirit, we can bear witness to the God who is deeply involved in our real issues. He's near to the brokenhearted. And Paul writes in this letter, in our suffering, God gives comfort that we can then share that comfort with others. And in our weaknesses, as pa Paul said about his, God's power is made perfect. Four, expect difficulty, stay committed. Paul had started the church in Corinth. Their faith in Jesus was the legacy of his commitment to Christ, and yet now many of them were now devaluing, even slandering him. How would that make you feel? If you're a parent, have you ever had a child say to you, I hate you? In all our relationships, there will be times of difficulty. In parenting, it goes from sleepless nights with newborns to challenging issues as your kids grow up and grapple with the mindsets of culture often at odds with the way of Jesus. These are times for listening, compassion, truth-telling, and prayer. Sexual temptation, confusion around sex, questions of gender identity, doubt, deconstruction. This is what our kids go through, even questioning of your authority. 
as did Corinth with Paul. And yet he pursues the relationship. Our heart is wide open. And that's in the perfect tense, which means Paul and his team have been open and will continue to be open despite how badly they have been treated. Five, go for the best. Keep it Christ-centered. I don't think Paul is really thinking about himself so much as he wants what is best for the Corinthians. He is a representative of Christ, and their doubts and or rejection of him is really more a rejection of the way of Christ. And that is what he is concerned about. The best for them is a better relationship with Paul, which leads to a better relationship with Jesus. And that's why Paul interjects into his urging for openness, a discussion of allegiance to Christ and Christian relationships as opposed to being unequally yoked with those who aren't followers of Jesus. He's already told the Corinthians that it's not that they should withdraw from relationships with people that don't share their faith. It's a question of influence. Paul says, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers, for what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? The deep openness that Paul is talking about leading to deeper relationship is to be for the purpose of knowing and following Jesus better. And any relationship that influences us to pull us away from Jesus is to be avoided. And so we are back to reinforce what we said last week. The church is to be a community that orbits around Jesus. Our openness is not to be a mechanism to gain attention. Our openness is to be an instrument to facilitate encouraging relationships that center around and grow in Jesus. Can we move towards that? So let me be open with you. As I was preparing this, I felt, Tim, you need to model this. Well, how should I do that? What do I need to share? What's appropriate in this online context? Share with them how it was for you putting this talk together. Okay. Yeah, I, I remember reading this text in 2 Corinthians a while ago, and this thought struck me in a new way. How important an open heart is to our discipleship, our, our, our following Jesus well. But I've realized I'm not always that open a person. I am more of a private person. Is that pride? And how has that affected those around me that I lead? How has it affected my church? And then, thinking about Paul's openness to those who were his critics, wow, when I'm criticized, I can't say that I have always moved towards people. To be honest with you, sometimes it's been too painful, and in the midst of all the things I'm responsible, too overwhelming. And I can't say that I've handled it as well as I could have. So this very subject of openness, I confess to you, is a weakness of mine that I need to grow in. And though I don't feel like I have it together to speak on this as one who has mastered it, I really do hope and pray that these moments together today will spur us all on to think about and to live out deeper, authentic, vulnerable relationships, first with God and then with each other as we pursue following Jesus with open hearts.